I wanted to talk today about when people knew there were problems at Fuku, uh, Fukushima Daiichi, uh, both in the uh, decades before the accident and then immediately after the accident. Um, but before I do, uh, th there are uh, hundreds of people uh, at Fukushima Daiichi and at Fukushima Daini who I'd like to acknowledge as my, my personal heroes. Uh, this was an accident, uh, uh, a tragedy, and, and, and caused by a failure of technology. Um, but what saved the day was human courage. So we have an example here of courage defeating uh, failures in technology because of several hundred people who, uh, who risked everything to save Japan and to save the world. And, and uh, uh, I am uh, uh, in awe of what they, what they did. The sequence is uh, the first two sections I'd like to talk about what happened 65, uh, in 1965. What was known before this plant was ever started? And the second two presentations is what is known now uh, after, uh, after the accident. The Fukushima Daiichi accident was made in America. The um, reactor was designed by General Electric and uh, built by a company called Ebasco. Uh, I, I used to go to the Abasco offices right here in Manhattan when I was an engineer on, uh, on Millstone Unit 1, which was almost identical to uh, Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1. Uh, it was licensed by the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, which at the time, in 1960s, uh, was the uh, ultimate authority on nuclear licensing in the world. At, at least we thought that to be the case. Um, this is not just a Daiichi issue. Um, there's 22 other plants in the United States that are similar. And the plants in the United States are in some ways much worse because there's a lot more waste fuel in their spent fuel pools than there were at Daiichi. The, uh, the engineers at General Electric and at Ibasco uh, made six critical mistakes in 1965 that were to doom Japan in 2011. The first five critical mistakes all revolve around the issue of, um, of not really understanding the power of a tsunami. Um, they reduced the height of the cliff that the plant was built on. Um, they built a short tsunami wall. The diesels were placed in the basement. The emergency pumps, called the service water pumps, were placed in a situation where they were underwater. And finally, the diesel tanks were placed in, um, in a place where they too were flooded. These were engineers based here in New York City um, that simply didn't understand the power of a tsunami. Uh, the last issue on the Mark I containment um, is a little broader, and I'll get onto that as well. Um, this is a picture of the cliff at Fukushima Daiichi in 1960. It was um, 35 meters high, about 115 feet high. Uh, the engineers at GE and Ibasco cut it down to 10 meters, so it was a 30-foot cliff. This is a picture after Daiichi was built. The, these areas here and here are, are at uh, 35 meters. The area along the seacoast is at 10 meters, and this is an access road cut down in through earth to get the plant close to the water. Well, tsunami is a Japanese word coming from tsu meaning harbor and nami meaning waves. Uh, the entire ocean rises up. If you're on a boat, you don't notice a tsunami because the entire ocean rises up, except when it hits a harbor and then it becomes terrifying. Uh, it travels at close to the speed of sound. Um, Engineers knew of tsunamis, uh, and I thought I'd just go back 100 years in Japanese history to look at, at Pacific Coast tsunamis that hit Japan. In 1896, there was a 40-meter tsunami. 1820, uh, 1923, there was a 13-meter tsunami. 1933, there was a 28-meter tsunami. And this was the tsunami of record as far as killing people um, before the Daiichi um, tsunami. 1944, there was a 12-meter tsunami. 46, 
another 12 meter tsunami. In 54 and 55, 10 years before Fukushima Daiichi was designed, there were three tsunamis, and all of them were over 13 meters. The tsunami that hit Fukushima Daiichi in 2011 was just a middle of the road tsunami compared to the 100 year history before it. But in face of that history, the tsunami wall was built by American engineers at four meters and later raised to 5.7 meters. In addition, the diesels were placed in the basement. Now diesels can be placed in the basement, but you should be able to put them in some sort of a waterproof container, which did not occur. It's important to know that General Electric built these first dozen or so Mark I reactors on what's called a turnkey contract. They took $60 million and built these plants and they lost their shirt. I know because I worked on one of these turnkey reactors, Millstone One, around the same time. So uh, there was a lot of economic pressures on General Electric to keep the cost down because they were losing money dramatically on the dozen reactors they had built on this turnkey process. In addition, the service water pumps had to be at the water but they were designed so that in any tsunami, they would have been flooded. So it doesn't matter that the diesels were in the basement. If the diesels had been on top of the Empire State Building, we'd have the same problem because the cooling pumps that cool the diesels would have been flooded. In addition, the fuel tanks that provide fuel for the diesels were also in the floodplain. So again, it's not about the diesels being flooded. It's about engineers here in New York City General Electric engineers and Abasco engineers who didn't appreciate the magnitude of a tsunami. Uh, this is an example of the, um, uh, this is the height of the seawall. And of course the pumps were totally inundated. The site was at 10 meters, but there was four meters more water on top of that. That's a 12 foot flood on top of Mother Earth. It was almost at the bottom of the control room. That's how much water there was on the site after the tsunami. Now there's some political issues going on as well. General Electric, whose motto, by the way, in 1960 was progress is our most important product, uh, said in 1961, they said, we're going to ram this nuclear thing through. Their chairman is quoted as saying that. And ram it through, they did. Uh, they met with the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, which in theory is an independent body designed to protect um, Americans in this case, but those the design decisions were driven into the Japanese design as well. And Dr. David Ockred, who was on the Advisory Committee, basically said that um, General Electric threatened them of going out of business unless the Advisory Committee um, continued with this Mark I design. Um, scientists in the United States 1965, recognized that this Mark I design had flaws. And as Dr. Ockrid said, I think it was kind of a threat. Now, Glenn Seaborg was the, was the chairman of the advisory committee at that time. And uh, he actually has an atom named after him. He's got an element, a Seaborgium named after him. This is a heavy hitter in the nuclear industry. Uh, and he said, I don't think we had the power to stop them. Now think about that. This is the United States government didn't have the power to stop General Electric's faulty design in 1966. Just about the time the Daiichi units were starting up in 72, there's a famous letter exchange with a, a senior scientist at General Electric named Joseph Hendry. And, um, and Mr. Hendry said that uh, he had serious doubts about the Daiichi design, the Mark I containment. But as I've highlighted at the end, he said that he felt they should be eliminated. But in eliminating this Mark I design, quote, it could well mean the end of nuclear power, creating more turmoil than I could stand. So the turmoil he chose to avoid in 1972 became the turmoil that Fukushima Daiichi experienced 40 years later. So when this plant started up, 
a made in America design. This is Fukushima Daiichi 1. Units 2, 3, and 4 aren't built yet. Fukushima Daiichi 1 was built by General Electric in Abasco on a turnkey project. There was no Japanese engineering on, on Fukushima Daiichi 1. All of the critical problems that Daiichi was to face 40 years later were in place. Essentially, the fuse was lit on Fukushima Daiichi in 1970, and it exploded in 2011. If we fast forward 40 years, this is the completed site right before the accident. And this is the tsunami hitting the plant. Um, the, the earth sunk a meter, three feet, after the earthquake. The tsunami was 15 meters high. But remember, it's moving at the speed of sound. So the wave, when it hit the plant, actually crested at 46 meters high over top of all these buildings. So how bad was it? The secret is in the assumptions. This is my favorite comic strip in the whole world. And for those of you who can't see it, I'll read it. The, uh, it's a Dilbert. The, uh, the pointy-headed boss says, um, I can do this feasibility analysis in two... Uh, yeah, Dilbert's being asked by the pointy-headed boss, and he says, I can do this feasibility analysis in two minutes. And then he says, it's the worst idea in the world. Numbers don't lie. Then the pointy-headed boss says, but our CEO loves the idea. And Dilbert says, luckily, assumptions do lie. So the, the, the message is here, when we're evaluating the ghost consequences of Fukushima Daiichi, the, uh, the secret is in the assumptions, which is where I'll spend the rest of this presentation. Assumption one is that uh, containments maintain their integrity. After all, they are called containments for a reason. They're meant to contain. Um, no containment in the world is designed to handle a detonation shockwave. That's a shockwave that travels faster than the speed of sound. There's 440 nuclear reactors, and none of them can handle a detonation shockwave, a shockwave that travels faster than the speed of sound, because engineers believed that it didn't, it couldn't happen. Well, right after it did happen, it's interesting that uh, the NRC's own Chuck Casso, now he's a senior guy, he's in charge of the NRC's Region 3 out of their Chicago office. A very senior guy at the NRC said this, of course, that Mark I containment is the worst containment we have. And if you have something called a loss of offsite power uh, or station backout, you are going to lose the containment. There's no doubt about it. So remember that, that Mr. Hendry at the NRC in 1972 said this was the worst containment in the world. And here's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying the same thing immediately after the accident. We've known for 40 years that this Mark I design, like a Daiichi, was an accident waiting to happen. Well, what does a meltdown look like? Uh, when I was in the industry, someone gave me some nuclear fuel, a uh, nuclear fuel rod. It didn't have nuclear fuel in it. And right after the accident, I heated it up to 2,000 degrees. This is what nuclear fuel looks like at 2,000 degrees. This is what was going on inside the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi when they didn't get their cooling order. This is pretty hot. Okay, this is a time lapse. I'll shoot through it really quickly. Um, Fukushima Daiichi units. One has already exploded. It's on the far left. Uh, then Daiichi 2, 3, and 4. Uh, keep your eye on Daiichi 3 in the middle. Right there is the beginning of something that the NRC believes can't happen. That's a detonation shockwave. Right there. There's the building intact. There's the building erupting with a detonation shockwave. Now, this can't happen, so uh, don't worry about it. These are, uh, these are time lapse of the detonation shockwave. And of course, you've all seen the devastation that a detonation shockwave can occur. Containments were meant to contain, and this is not supposed to happen. Assumption number two is containment leakage. Now, Dave Lockbaum was on top of this back uh, uh, before the accident, and certainly during the accident, as was Fairwinds. Um, what happened inside the Daiichi reactor was that the pressures got so high that the bolts that hold the containment together began to stretch. 
and hot radioactive gases